guys, welcome back to or welcome to my channel. If you haven't been here before, my name is Chayan Olchin. And if you have, thank you so much for watching my videos and supporting me. You guys have no idea how much it means to me. You're really making my dream come true and I can't thank you guys enough for it. In today's video, I am doing another installment in my series, True Crimes of Australia. And as you can probably already tell from the title, I am covering the case of The Lost Girls, which is what the public dubbed this case as. The book that I purchased and used to help me research this case is actually The Lost Girls by Ava Benning Morrison, who has been a journalist since 2009. And I really love this book. It is so well written and it is pretty long, as you can tell. But just the writing, the information, it is really good. And the way that things are explained throughout this book is fucking awesome. And the book explained a lot about the case, including practices that law enforcement uses to help identify remains. And also how they go about dealing with stuff like identity theft and fraud, which sadly did occur with this case. This case is about the brutal murders of a young mum by the name of Carla J. Pierce Stevenson and her daughter Candace Kira Pierce. And although all true crime content is dark, heavy, sad and heartbreaking, I will put in a little disclaimer now. This case is extremely dark, it's extremely heavy and heartbreaking and it does cover, in this video I will cover the possible sexual assault that Kendallis may have had to endure in her last hours as well as the sexual assault that um, Carly had to face and just the brutal way that they were both murdered and especially the way that they found um, the remains of these two individuals. If you feel that you are affected by stuff like this or impacted negatively, I will recommend clicking off this video now before I get into the case more. If you guys have been here since the beginning of this series and saw my six part mini series on the Ivan Malat backpacker murders case then you will remember that in the episode where I covered a list of suspected victims of Ivan Malat you will remember that the name Angel came up for remains that were found in the Belangelo State Forest in 2010. The remains were named Angel after a t-shirt was found at the scene that had the word angelic written across it and a lot of people speculated that these remains very well could have been that of an ace victim of Ivan Malat. However, police were very, very quickly able to rule out Ivan Malat as their killer because by the time this murder would have taken place, Ivan Malat was already in prison. And police even briefly considered that maybe his nephew, Matthew Malat could have been their killer, but that was ruled out pretty quickly as well, mainly because he would have been ex pretty young when the murder had taken place. While investigating the crime scene, police very quickly found some other two other objects that helped them kind of confirm the gender for the remains, and the items they found were one small white sock and a single silver sleeper earring. So this led them to believe pretty quickly on that they were handling the remains of a young female. The remains were later on um, identified as Carly Pierce Stevenson. And let's jump back into time when Carly's remains were first found because this is where the investigation starts. It holds a lot of information including what they do to be able to identify a set of remains. And it also holds information as to how they were able to connect Candlest and 
um, Carly as mother and daughter. On the 29th of August 2010, a group of people riding trail bikes near the Red Arm Creek Fire Trail in the Blangeley State Forest made an accidental horrific discovery. They discovered some bones that looked like they were slightly covered by some branches. Obviously, the group of riders knew about Ivan a lot. You'll be you would have a really hard time finding an Australian who didn't know about Ivan Malat and his reign of terror. And immediately some members of the group thought the worst. They were just like, oh, fuck, we found the eighth victim. However, they convinced themselves that it was probably just the remains of an animal like a kangaroo or a wombat or whatever and continued on riding. That was until later on in the day when they came back to that very same spot and spotted some other bones that were a bit bigger and they decided to head out of the forest to get some phone reception and called the police. The police were there in no time. When police got to the scene they confirmed that sadly this group of riders had stumbled across a set of human um, remain. And even the police um, officers that were first on the scene there dreaded the thought that maybe an eighth victim to fall to Ivan Malat had been found. However, they couldn't focus on this thought long and had to push it out of their heads because most investigators and detectives and police are taught not to settle on one theory straight away. They have to keep an open mind and let the evidence paint a picture and take them to the right conclusion. After searching the scene, taking it off and processing the crime scene, the remains were then sent to the morgue at Glebe to hopefully be identified so that the family and friends of the victim could finally have some closure. However, it would be years before they were able to finally identify the remains as Carly Jade Pierce Stevenson. It had actually been five years since the remains were first found when they were able to finally identify Carly. When the remains were first found, police went above and beyond to, to identify the remains, including scouring missing persons reports numerous times and ultimately that turned up no leads and they were no they weren't any closer to identifying who this woman was. They also seriously toyed with the idea that maybe this woman had been from overseas and they cross checked immigration records and Interpol for overseas missing person cases that could have been the answer. They were looking for someone who hadn't been seen in years and was in the age range of 13 to 25. This again turned up no leads and no clues whatsoever and now they were even more confused because they didn't know who this person was. They didn't know why they were killed, how they were killed and they couldn't bring their killer to justice and it must have been so frustrating feeling like you hadn't taken any steps forward and somehow still took 20 steps backward because there was nothing. I will be mentioning some names throughout this video of people that helped in this case and I'm doing this because I believe that they really do deserve recognition for their hard work and the fact that even though it took five years to identify Carly's remains they never gave up, they never stopped hoping, they were constantly doing whatever they could to try and match up the remains with a missing person. And I feel they deserve recognition for it. The first person I am going to talk about is Dr. David Bruce. Dr. Bruce is a forensic biologist and has done most of his work with the FASS. And his job is to um, basically analyze the forensic value of evidence and to analyze DNA profiles extracted from unidentified remains and to confirm the identities of murder victims. 
His work along with his colleagues has solved some of New South Wales' most high-profile high cases. And the next morning after the remains of Angel were found in a Belangelo State Forest, a box containing a tibia bone was sent to the, a the FASS laboratory for a DNA profile generation. Dr. Bruce's job as a senior forensic biologist means that it is up to him to confirm a DNA match. However, the job of extracting DNA falls onto someone else. That person was Miss Carl Wilson. And she was the only biologist at the FASS at the time who were qualified to extract nuclear DNA from bones. And she had been with the, a the FASS since 2001, right around the time when DNA was becoming a really important tool for solving crimes and missing person cases. Originally, Kara Wilson had been studying immunology and her original plan was that if she couldn't get into a university to study science, she would join the police force. However, luckily for her, later on, she was able to bring both of these patterns together and found her job. And it put her in the thick of DNA becoming really important and cracking open, like, cracking a lot of these cases open and solving them. Now, how they actually extract um, nuclear DNA is actually really interesting. What they need to do first is to clean the bone and then break that bone down into a powder. And Carl Wilson noted pretty uh, quickly that the bone was in surprisingly really good condition for the fact that it had most likely gone through at least one controlled burn in that particular area of the Belangelo State Forest and the fact that it had been exposed to the element and could have been there for as long as 10 years. Breaking the bones into a powder is a really long process. It can take up to half a day, sometimes more in certain cases. And when they begin the process of breaking the bone down into a powder, they need to do what they call it drawing the hood, which is a clear bit of perfect with two holes in it so that whoever performing the procedure can actually put their hand through those two holes and while they're wearing gloves. So when the bone is placed onto the workbench, there is normally a metre um, wide divider and an inbuilt exhaust fan to protect the person performing this process from the dust that will be produced by thawing, cutting and um, sanding the bone. After breaking the bone down into as much of a powder as they can do physically, the pieces of bone are then placed in a cylinder and then submerged in liquid nitrogen which turns what is left of the bone fragment into to full on powder. Doing this allows the person performing this procedure to see exactly how much nuclear DNA there is and in this circumstance luckily there was enough nuclear DNA to create an entire um, DNA profile. And this DNA profile then um, uploaded to the NCI which is the National Criminal Investigation DNA Database uh, in the hopes of finding a match. And this didn't happen unfortunately and which was really heartbreaking to people working on this case but the fact that they had the nuclear DNA and were able to make a full DNA profile actually proved pretty handy later on in the case. When no magic came up in the NTI um, DNA database it took a year of trial and error before the police force decided to contact someone to create a 3D facial approximation based on the DNA profile. And they did this in the hope that maybe this might prompt more tips and more calls to the police. And this would actually be the first time in New South Wales that 3D facial approximation was used in a homicide investigation. This brings us to Dr. Suzanne Hayes, and Dr. Hayes is actually a forensic 
anthropologist at the University of Western Australia and she was contacted by Detective Sergeant Tim Atwood. When he contacted her, she was actually doing a 3D facial reconstruction workshop in Canberra at the National Portrait Gallery. And Detective Atwood was actually from the New South Wales Homicide Squad. Two weeks later, after initially being contacted by Detective Atwood, Dr. Hayes was greeted by a group of odontologists, pathologists and other detectives at Sydney's morgue. This morgue is actually located in the belly of the coroner's court complex on Parramatta Road in Glebe. And the room she was working in was normally reserved for murder victims. As Dr. Hayes began working, she also noted that the remains were in pretty good condition and she focused on getting the jaw to best fit with the rest of the skull and this would be her guide to what this girl's face, was, the shape of her face was like. As she was doing this, she was also taking note of T's um, dimensions so that she could actually determine the size of this girl's mouth. While doing this, she also noted that the lateral incisors, incisors were missing, but it didn't really concern her. It isn't uncommon for them to be missing as it is extremely easy for single rooted teeth to be dislodged. She noted that all other teeth were exactly where they should have been and that also didn't raise any flags. Then using measurements, it made it way easier for her to determine what this girl's face shape and size actually was and in doing this, this meant taking measurements of the jaw width and height, teeth height and also the nasal aperture um, dimension and also the orbital bones. After this, the skull was then placed back onto its stand and would check multiple times before multiple photos were taken and it actually would aid Dr. Hayes in estimating what the girl's face looked like and all the aspects of it. With the permission of Detective Atwood, Suzanne um, brought in one of her hairdresser's friends by the name of Sally Bowley. The only thing that Susan couldn't really get a feel for or an idea of when studying the skull was what kind of hair this girl might have had and when her friend Sally saw photographs of hair that was found at the scene of the crime she was able to determine pretty quickly that the hair was medium length straight and had never been bleached or dyed and with that um, information then Dr. Hayes was able to come up with a hairstyle that was shoulder length layered and had a long um, side fringe, which I gotta say is really to really damn spot on. Weeks later, with the final product of her 3D um, facial approximation uh, finished, she finally had the estimated look for what the girl looks like staring right back at her. She had white set eyes, a full face, thin lips, a small mouth, and a wide jaw. The estimated look also showed that the girl's nose stood out against her soft face. On the 2nd of December 2011, police released this um, facial reconstruction to the public as part of their plan to ignite more public interest in the case and to also prompt more tips and call to police hoping to maybe finally identify this one. Because of them releasing this facial reconstruction um, image to the public, it led to 35 calls to police. However, sadly none of those um, gave any leads or tips. Now let's jump forward to July of 2015. Three men who were travelling to Adelaide had pulled over on the Karunda Highway to answer nature call, call and where they pulled over was Chepa, the really tiny town of Wanaka. And fun fact, Wanaka actually is an Aboriginal word that means a strayer 
and I thought that was pretty interesting. When the driver of the vehicle pulled over so that they could all take a little walk, like dress their legs, obviously Anthony took a call. He walked a couple meters away from the car and noticed uh, where the ground turned into really half shrub. There was actually a really, really tattered and kind of suspicious look. The content of the bag was sprawled right across the ground and he immediately noticed that there was a few really grubby clothing items including an old small pink jacket, a black ballerina skirt and he also noticed that there was a very tiny pair of silk shorts with the Holden logo on them. Although that wasn't all he noticed. Very quickly he noticed a jawbone among all the clothing and was horrified by this discovery. And obviously after a little while his friends got curious and walked over to see what he had found. Not realising that they too would come across this kind of horrific discovery as well. Um, they automatically saw the jawbone was small enough to be a child and although they were horrified by the discovery they didn't call police right away. They waited until the next morning when they were finally in Adelaide to call police and one of the three men actually said to the operator when he called that they had accidentally come across um, parts of a human skeleton that seemed small enough to be of a child. Hours later and that particular stretch of the Karunda Highway was busy with police officers and police officers from the nearest town were first on the scene and they confirmed that inside that tattered 60 by 40 centimeter suitcase there was indeed the skeleton of a child. They found that wrapped around the torso was actually a really heavily stained elderberry towel that had a down under towel tag on it. And after testing, a pathologist did confirm that these stains were indeed blood stains. The pathologist also confirmed that the discoloured patches on the other clothing items were actually blood stains as well. It was also concluded that the child was most likely not in skeletal state when they were shoved into that suitcase and thrown out onto that extremely remote highway like they were nothing but rubbish. However, at the scene they did find a hand stitched quilt with um, patches that were octagonal and the patches had p tiny pictures of animals, flowers and pumpkins and there was also black fabric bordering the quilt and the black fabric also contained musical notes. The quilt was 90 by 90 centimeters and though it was machine stitched, the patterns were complex and would have most likely required the skill of a experienced quilter. When looking at the remains, police discovered a mat of long blonde hair and sadly found that there was dull grey duct tape wrapped around the skull from just from the chin to just below the eye socket. They also found a baby disposable nappy which had been soiled by the Murray Malays dirt and when they found this nappy it was actually found um pressed up against the side and front of the skull. When the duct tape had finally been um, pulled back by a forensic pathologist, they found traces of a blue and white disc cloth very much like a chuck. White protruding from the tiny row of top teeth and sadly they also found a, another cloth screwed up in a ball towards the back of the jaw. Because detectives had to work their way from the ground up, they went and questioned every single resident in Wanaka as it was the closest area and even though there was a very small group of people living there, it was the closest area to where the suitcase had been found and they were extremely cooperative but were also extremely shocked at the discovery of the remains 
and they very early on a lot of people in Wanaka were pointing out the sighting of a strange man walking along the Karuna Highway in early 2015 carrying a suitcase. On the 15th of July the remains were sent to the State Forensic Science Centre in Adelaide's DDB ahead of the post-mortem examination the next day. The bones showed no sign of injury, however because there was no soft tissue it meant that a forensic pathologist wouldn't be able to rule out injuries before death and the forensic pathologist did say that um, because of the tape found around the skull and the traces of disc cloth and the disc cloth found in the back of the jaw that the child's um, cause of death would have been asphyxiation. When the news broke about a child's remains being found along an extremely remote stretch of highway, people had their fair shares as to who they thought the remains could have been and members of the public speculated that the remains could have been um, William Terrell and some people even speculated that the remains might have been that of missing British um, girl Madeleine McCann who originally went missing in um, 2007 during a family vacation in Portugal. However, both of these were very very quickly ruled out. Um, they pretty much knew straight away that the remains were that of a girl based on the pink jumper and the ballerina skirt. And for so long, Candelice was known as the girl in the suitcase because at that point, no one knew her identity and no one could figure it out until one particular call came through. I will be reading in a second just so I get this bit of information correct. But let's jump forward to the morning of the 6th of October when a woman by the name of Tanya Weber rang. And she said, it's a long shot, but the girl in the suitcase could be Candelise Kira Pierce. We haven't seen her in years. No one has seen her in a long time. Her mom is Carly J. Pierce Stevenson. Tanya went on to explain that she recognised some of the clothing, mainly the mostly the pink coat and pants and she recognised the hand stitch quilt as well. Um, Tanya rang again on the 8th of October just two days after her first call to press the importance of her information. She also said she had three photographs that investigators needed to see. Logged at call number 1267, Tanya's information was passed on to South Australian detectives. That night she received a call from Detective Sergeant Blake Holder who was from the Major Crime Investigation Branch. He asked her to email him the photograph. She sent the email at 10pm 10, uh, 10 with the subject line as photos of Candelish. Tanya then said the following in that email. Hi Blake, thank you for following up my concern. These are the only photos I have of Candles. Um, the pink dress she is wearing is the same as the photo I found on, found on the web attached. I will see if I can find Colleen's, Kendall's grandmother's, um, old USB stick that may have other photos. Regards, Tanya Weber. The photos that Detective Holder received from Tanya were three very similar ones of a young girl around the age of two with bright blonde hair and she was wearing a black headband that was pushing her hair back and she was also wearing a light pink dress that was cotton and had bare stripes on it. Her little fingers were wrapped around a pram and in one of the photos she had her head slightly tilted while she was looking directly at the camera. An hour later, um, Detective Holder did call Tanya back and say that they had located Carly Interstate However, in another follow-up email, um, Detective Holder was asking Tanya a lot of questions about the girls, such as their birthplace, family um, illness history, the name of Carly's grandmother, who had um, stitched the quilt for Candelise, and also Carly's last known phone number. Detective Holder was also looking for contact details 
of one of Carly's friends who had started a Facebook page to look for Carly. After answering all of Detective um, Holder's questions, he had to inform Tanya that they sadly had not located Carly J. P. Stevenson and rather they had located someone with a really similar name. They were able to finally identify the remains as um, Candley Kira Pierce when um, they looked into her immunization records and realized that she had been immunized at 18 months old and that she would never immunize further than after that. Um, some people get more immunization that they get older, especially when they hit school. And they also found that she had never been involved in any school in Australia and at that point in time she should have been around 9 years old. It really seems like she just disappeared in late 2008 and detectives did request a access to a record of Candelisa's newborn screening test which were taken at Alice Springs Hospital. Ever since the 1960s, babies in Australia have undergone pain prick tests in maternity ward two to three days after birth and this blood sample is used to test for a range of congenital diseases and this blood sample is then blotted onto a piece of card and the length of time that this, these cards are kept by different um, health departments across the country really does vary between the different states and territories. Candelisa's grocery card was stored at the Women and Children's Hospital in North Adelaide and forensic biologists were able to take this blood sample and generate a DNA profile which they then compared against the skeletal remains found in the suitcase and it was a match. After three months of searching they finally had an identity. They told the family on the 12th of October that the remains were indeed Candelise and they told the family to stay quiet and not tell anyone about this development as there was still an ongoing investigation into finding the killer responsible and bringing them to justice. At this point in time with this case they could not afford anything getting out just yet. For the next nine days, the family members really did just cut themselves off from the world. They stopped answering their phones, stopped answering text messages, emails, and didn't talk to anyone, didn't see anyone, and really risked so many friendships in doing so. And while they were in this, they were literally in solitary for nine days, they were left wondering what had happened to Carly. On the 15th of October, it had been five years since Carl Wilson had extracted a DNA profile from the remains of Angel that were found in the Belangelo State Forest. And in all that time, the DNA profile was just sitting in the national database waiting to be matched to another case. Miss Wilson one day received a call from FIRM, which is the abbreviation for the Forensic Intelligence and Results Management Unit. The call was to do with the little girl found in the suitcase and after using Candelisa's medical record to identify the bone, the focus had shifted to Carly once again and the question everyone was asking was where was Carly? Carly had left Alice Springs in November of 2008 and she headed to Adelaide and while she was in Adelaide she met a friend at a shopping centre and then she left for Canberra and Canberra is actually less than two hours away from the Belangelo State Forest. South Australia Police then got in contact with New South Wales Homicide Squad and they wanted to test the DNA of Candelise against the DNA extracted from the remains found in the Belangelo State Forest in 2010. The sort of the DNA's matching seemed almost impossible to most people as the remains of these two individuals were found almost on opposite sides of the country and they were found five years apart. Carla Wilson, when she got the email, she printed off both pages. One was a profile of Angel's DNA and the other was of Candelisa's DNA. And most people who've done basic science know that 
a child inherit half of their mother's DNA and half of their father's DNA. This meant that if Candelise was really Angel's daughter, that half of the DNA would be a match, and it was. Miss Wilson checked the profile a number of times, not believing her eyes, and that it would match. And then she called her superior, Dr. Bruce, who looked over it and confirmed that the DNAs were indeed a match. Now, it, we need to talk about the person who was responsible for Candelisa's and Carly's murder. The man at the time was going by the name of Daniel Marshall, but his real name is Daniel Holden. Now, from Daniel Holden's accounts of his early life, he did have a pretty rough upbringing and a pretty traumatic birth which resulted in his mother not loving him. This is what he claimed. Um, again, he had lied multiple times to save his ass, so you can't really believe everything he says. Daniel Holden was the last person to be seen with Carly and Candelise. And Daniel had actually met Carly's mum, Colleen, and her sisters, um, Carly's mum's sisters, and none of them liked him from the second they saw him. There was just something off with Daniel. The few, the three things that came up with all of their accounts is his obvious drug use, his short one-worded answer to their question, and also his lack of eye contact with anyone. Carly's family in Alice Springs met Daniel a couple days after Carly broke up with her long-term boyfriend and Carly's family, especially her mum, felt so uneasy about Daniel that when Daniel and Carly announced that they were going on a road trip to South Australia with Candelise, Colleen actually asked and almost begged Carly to leave Candelise with her instead. Daniel later told investigators that during this time, this brief time, he and Carly were actually having a fling. As the three of them set off on their little road trip, they got to Carly's father's place and Carly's father wasn't actually home, but his mum was, and his mum was so happy to see Carly and to see Candelise, but she stated that the second she saw Daniel, everything in the atmosphere around them kind of changed and she just did not like him, did not trust him. And she stated that it was for the exact same reason that everyone else felt there was something off with it. At the time when they identified Carly and Candelise, Daniel James Holden was serving time in Death Not Jail and he had actually just been denied parole and he wouldn't be able to apply again for another 12 months. The reason why he was serving time in Sethna Jail was because he was actually arrested for sexually assaulting a 9 year old girl in a caravan in 2013. At the time he was staying at the Blue Bay Caravan Park with his then girlfriend Tony Blundell who was from um, Charnwood, which is a suburb in northern Canberra. Tony was only 17 years old and when she and Daniel decided to move to the caravan park, there was a little nine-year-old girl who used to love spending time with Tony. They used to play games on the iPad together, they used to watch YouTube and they would watch movies together. I'm almost completely fine with it. Tony had travelled back to Canberra to see her family and the little girl walked over to the caravan to have dinner and the little girl's mum was completely fine with this. She trusted Tony, she liked Tony. However, neither of them realised that Tony had left for Canberra a couple days earlier. Daniel told investigators that he had been on ice at the time and hadn't slept in three days. That she had told, he had told the little girl that Tony wasn't there and invited her in anyways. The girl was laying on the bunk bed watching some movies and that was when Daniel made his move. He kept moving closer and closer to her until he pulled her PJ pants down and sexually assaulted her. Two days later, she cried as she told her mum what had happened and her mum was absolutely horrified and her mum's boyfriend who had heard the confession 
was full of rage because who the hell does that to a young child? Anyone, especially a young child. And he went straight over to Daniel's um, caravan to, you know, knock his lights out, punch his lights out. And Daniel sprinted from the caravan and where did he choose to go to? He ran to the nearest police station and tried to lie to them about what was going on. However, he did crack under pressure and pled guilty to sexual assault with a child under the age of 10. For this, he was given four years prison time and a non-parole period of two years. Honestly, four years prison time and a non-parole period of two years is fucking disgusting. It should be more than that is a fucking slap on the wrist. Friends of Daniel who lived in Charnwood were questioned by police on the 21st of October 2015 at 7am. This was because they were actually the last people to have seen Carly and Candelise alive besides Daniel. They last saw the two girls alive seven years before and it was because of these friends that Daniel met Tony in the first place. They were the last people to see Carly J. Pierce Stevenson alive on the 14th of December 2008. And they both said in separate statements made to police that there had actually been a pretty big fight between Carly and Daniel, which resulted in Carly taking off in her Holden Commodore and Daniel following her. And they both left Candelise by herself with this couple and their names are actually Derek and Christine. When Daniel finally came back at around midday the next day, um, Derek said that there was a scratch on Daniel's face and that he had removed a blanket from the boot of Carly's Commodore before cleaning it. Christine then asked where Carly was and Daniel said that he'd just left her at a bus stop, which made Derek ask, about Carly leaving Candelise behind with them and Daniel actually said that Carly leaves Candelise behind quite often and that he was going to be taking Candelise back to her grandmother. Derek then told police that he helped Daniel trade in Carly's Holden Commodore for an older Holden um, Batesman. Derek's name was on the record of sale which was carried out on the 17th of December 2008 and as luck would have it, it was because Daniel did not have a license. Two days later, Daniel strapped Candelise into the back seat of the statesman and then took her for South Australia and that was the last time that Christine and Derek saw Candelise. After this, police became interested in the Blundell family as Tony had dated Daniel before he was arrested for sexually assaulting a nine-year-old. And they were pretty shocked to find a lot of Daniel slash Carly's possessions there. They found Carly's SIM card, her phone, her Medicare card and also her library card that had her signature on the back. They also looked through Tony's diary and there was one entry in particular that caught the attention of investigators. Things feel dear. Daniels lied to me. Said he killed Carly and Kendall, but they're still alive. It's all over Facebook, but he said they're dead. And made, he's made them think she's alive, but everything he said don't make sense. App, he killed her. December, December, 2008. But people have her cash on her, have sent her cash on her daughter's birthday, 2010-2011. Got a text from Hazel saying they're dead and she's seen pics now. She's waiting to see if this shirt was hers, so if so, then she really is gone. Sent him a pic of her soon. He slash they found her top and said he threw it over her. No one knows who she is. Again, she used a lot of different uh, abbreviations, short things down, and it's really hard to read. But yeah, that seemed really 
fitted and after they she mentioned the name Hazel with the investigators knew was Daniel's ex they then went and questioned her. Daniel had caused the accident that cost the lives of two of her children and caused her to need a wheelchair for the rest of her life. While she was in hospital for her really bad injuries Daniel had left her for Carly but then after Carly disappeared he came running right back to her and the pair got back together. When police showed up at Hazel's place they were greeted by Hazel's boyfriend James Matheson. I hope I'm saying that right. James Madison? Math Matheson I think. And he was very visibly confused when they explained that they were there to talk to Hazel about the murders of Carly and Candley. When they also explained that they had a warrant to search the premises, he looked even more confused than before and said, oh shit, before letting them in. When they stepped inside the house, they very quickly spotted Hazel in her wheelchair with a two-year-old boy. They explained to Hazel that they were there in relation to the murders and had a warrant to search the premises. Hazel made a point of letting police know that she was in hospital when Daniel left with Carly and she laughed when saying this that in a way to him police seemed like there was a lot of venom and hatred behind it. When the pair got back together Hazel asked multiple times where Carly was, thinking Carly was still in the ACT. However, Daniel tried to lie to Hazel and say that Carly had gone back to her ex in Alice Springs. Hazel, however, knew that this wasn't true because Carly's ex was still messaging her asking if she knew where she was or if she'd seen her. She then claimed that Daniel told her that Carly had gone to Queensland. However, Hazel felt that this was a lie because she kept thinking that his long stint away from home was really him cheating with Carly and she would pretty often search through all of his things to confirm her suspicions so she wouldn't feel crazy. Hazel also told police that when she and Daniel lived together, she turned the bedroom upside down and found needles and glass pipes which really shocked her because she didn't know that Daniel was a drug user and she also claimed that Daniel was a porn addict. While talking to police, Hazel um, described coming across a photo on the computer once that Daniel had taken of Carly where Carly was kind of laying on her back with a shirt on and a glass bottle in between her legs and her face was either turned away or covered by a branch. It was by luck that the team working this case had that photo fall into their laps. On the other hand, after Daniel had changed his story by this point at least 10 times, Hazel took a deal and on camera said, I found one of her cards and I didn't think anything bad at the time. I thought, you know, he was just seeing her and, you know, had lied to me again. He did say then, you know, no, no, she's gone. She's gone for good. He did admit what he'd done then, but I didn't believe him. I thought, I don't know if you understand, Daniel, but his lies are always extreme. He said that he, said that he had raped her with a bottle. He had dumped on her throat and crushed her windpipe. That was, all, that was about all he said. As Hazel was saying this, she's trying not to cry and does her, but, but her best to get the words out. She then went on to say that Daniel had told her that he tried to have sex with Candelise and she wouldn't stop crying so he stopped the crying by shoving her panties down her throat, which is what killed her. He continued to have sex with her body and then threw it out like trash. She also claimed that the reason he killed Carly was because she was trying to get to her daughter and that even when he was hurting her, he had to crush her throat from crawling to be able to get to her baby. Back to Carly and Candelise though, when they were finally about to be laid to rest, they had a coffin big enough to fit the mother and daughter in them so that they could be laid to rest together after seven years apart. On top of the coffin, there were pink lilied, pale blue hydrangeas and baby birth. 
These were a tribute to the mother and daughter and their favourite colours. And a funeral director in Adelaide had arranged for them to be custom made. He had never met the pair but was moved by their loss like most Australians were. Back in 2012, um, Carly's mum Colleen had passed away from cancer and right up until she died, she was always asking about Carly and Candelise and when they would be there. She sadly died not ever knowing what had happened to her daughter and her granddaughter. Carly was 20 years old and Candelise was just 2 years old when they were both brutally slaughtered. On the 15th of December 2015, on the 7th anniversary of Carly's murder, Daniel James Holden was formally charged with her murder and they also believe that he used he killed Candelise in order to distract people from Carly's murder. Investigators found out during the investigation that Candelise had been killed inside Street 32 at the Narendra Midtown Motor Inn. Daniel then went to trial and at first he pled guilty to both, to both counts of murder and towards the end of his trial he tried to change his um, plea and say not guilty however this didn't work. He was sentenced to two life sentences for the two lives he had taken so brutal. Daniel James Holden then did his time rotating between Sethnock, Goulburn, Silverwater and Parkley jails and he did try to appeal his sentence in 2018 but was denied. Tanya had promised Colleen before she died that she would find her daughter and her granddaughter and Colleen's last words were actually can you look after Luke which is Carly's younger brother and can you find Carly. Tanya felt that she had kind of bailed her friend but she really didn't. I know a lot of other people have said this but on the off chance that Tanya ever finds this video I hope she knows that she didn't fail Colleen. It was because of her mentioning that the remains could have been of Candelise that they were able to identify Candelise and Carly's remains and to finally reunite the pair in one of the most heartbreaking ways possible after so long apart and to finally reunite them with Connie and Colleen and you didn't give up and it paid off big time. That is all for today's video this is such a heartbreaking case I cried quite a lot while researching it there was one night where I was up till like four o'clock in the morning researching and when I read the part about in um, this book, when I read the part of them getting a coffin big enough for the pair of them to be laid to rest together after so long apart, it broke my heart and I did bawled my eyes out. And as much as I love learning about the forensics and how they solve these cases, it is still really heartbreaking and it fucking sucks that this kind of stuff happens. It fucking sucks that people do this type of thing to innocent people and the fact that like with sexual assault of a minor, a child that like with Daniel James Holden the first time, four years prison time, two years of non-parole period that is a fucking slap on the wrist and Australia needs to work its shit out and actually lock these people away because these people are dangerous Anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed this video as much as it is heartbreaking. I hope it sheds light on how much work um, good police officers do to solve these cases. And if you feel you know anything about any case, if you have any suspicions, if you, even if it's the tiniest, most stupid detail you can think of, it could help solve a case. So call crime, stop it, call police. Um, Start spreading awareness about certain cases, missing person cases. It can really be what breaks the case 
wide open and get solved. And yeah, I hope you guys like this video. And remember, if you are interested in this case, I highly recommend getting this book, The Lost Girl by Ava Benning Morrison. It goes way more in depth into this case than what I did. And yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed it and I'll see you guys next time. Bye.